Hello, resilient leaders. I'm Katie Glenn, host of our Resilient Controller Track. I am thrilled to welcome you to our Resilient Controller podcast, where we embark on a journey of discovery through engaging and authentic conversations. Thank you for tuning in and being a part of this community. In every episode, we're on a quest to unveil the true essence of resilience, that magical quality that helps us bounce back stronger than before. We're not just talking about it, but we're diving deep into real candid conversations that spark inspiration and fuel that inner fire to stay resilient in our journeys. I try to make sure that I'm leading in a collaborative way and listening with empathy. Sean O'Hara, Director of Accounting, Reporting, and Internal Controls from Nissan North America, brings a wealth of expertise and a unique perspective on resilience, overcoming obstacles, and thriving in an ever-changing world. In Sean's words, being resilient means taking those shots and challenges and becoming stronger as a result. Get ready for an enlightening exchange as we explore Sean's pathway to resilience and uncover his secrets to navigating the complexities of his career and life. So grab your favorite drink, get cozy, and let's kick back for a chat that's not just about business, but about life, challenges, and the awesome resilience that keeps us going. Sean, thank you for joining us on today's podcast. How are you? I'm doing well, Katie. Thanks very much for having me. Always good to connect with you and and looking forward to hearing more about your experiences and and talking about how you're a resilient leader. Let's learn more about you. Can you share a bit about your background, maybe maybe your career journey that led you to being the director of accounting and reporting and controls at Nissan North America? Sure thing. Happy to. I grew up in the Philadelphia area, but like uh, many engineering students, I found some challenges with the science courses and pivoted to accounting and international business. I spent time studying abroad at Costa Rica uh, as part of that international business program and joined a big four firm and got my CPA license and, you know, joined the audit practice there and worked on various clients and in various industries. Uh, I appreciated that I got to see a broad range of uh, clients while I was there and and across my my time in audit, working with uh, public and private companies, not-for-profits, industrial products, uh, working with healthcare, and um, yeah, a lot of various uh, clients. It actually, I think, uh, you know, gave me some opportunities uh, to eventually uh, join their national office. So I got to consult on various engagements. And then that eventually led me to uh, go into Nashville, uh, where I was, uh, you know, working with a few clients in Nashville, and it brought me to actually consulting with Nissan. And uh, I got to peek behind the curtain a little bit with how their operations are. I was not doing audit work with them. I was doing uh, accounting uh, advisory work. And uh, so I was able to spend some time with them and peek behind the curtain a little bit and kind of see how things worked. And uh, I was always very nervous that, you know, so I was in public accounting for over 15 years. I was always nervous about leaving that I'd find myself bored going Mm -hmm. to private. So being able to, to work closely with Nissan before I joined them and see like, oh, this is this is a very dynamic place to work, even though it doesn't have the constant uh, change that is so uh, prominent in public accounting. There's a lot to do. And I appreciate now that I'm at Nissan. I work with the manufacturing teams. I work with the uh, sales finance teams. I see a lot of different things while I'm here that I appreciate that that keeps me busy, keeps me on my toes. And I'm also fortunate I get to work with a wonderful team of over 140 people here in uh, both the U.S. and we have folks in Mexico who help work on our uh, uh, North American uh, reporting responsibilities that I'm responsible for. Wow, quite quite the background and the career to land you to where you are. I can I can absolutely appreciate you know call it the fear of of leaving something that is known and you've been doing for so long and for doing it that long i imagine very well at it mm-hmm. uh to, to embarking on something something completely new but it sounds like there's definitely enough going on and enough uh change that you're not bored absolutely not no uh I, i'm not bored and uh, I'm, uh, it's actually uh, you know it's very exciting uh, every day there's there's something new uh, whether it's a new product or a new uh, transaction uh, or 
if it's a, a change in the accounting rules and figuring out how that impacts us across U.S. GAAP, IFRS standards. And you know, I work for a Japanese company, so we have to uh, look at what's going on with JGAP as well. So, yeah, very exciting uh, to work at Nissan. Sean, you said that you have 140 people on your team. Yes. Like, what's it feel like to be the guy, right? Your team is looking at you as, as the guy to learn something from. How, do, how does that feel? So uh, I try to make sure that I'm leading in a collaborative way and listening with empathy, right? I, I don't think there's any way I can know exactly what everyone on my team is going through. Uh, but I try to, to listen and engage as much as possible. And I've got a great team of uh, folks that re- work directly for me. And I've got a great you know, team of people underneath them. And really, I- I've tried to meet everyone on my team. Uh, it- it's hard in this uh, environment we're in with, you know, a lot of times their folks are remote or, as I mentioned, they're in different countries and different offices. But I've tried to engage with everyone, at least in some capacity, and understand okay, what's going on specifically to this individual? What's going on specifically to this team? I, a lot of times I feel like folks are only pushing down the message about, you know, here's the concerns of our organization. Here's my personal concerns. How can you help me through that? I want to make sure I'm always listening. Well, what's going on? What are the challenges on the teams? What are the challenges with the individuals? Uh, do we have a problem with an application that we're using that's not working right? Do we have a problem with a, a supplier or a customer um, that, that that's quite challenging? And so I want to make sure I'm listening and, uh, and and taking that to heart and, and you know, really applying that information that I'm learning uh, through listening. So I try to like, I'd like to think that I take into consideration all of the various stakeholders, whether, you know, whether it's my boss, my peers, our customers, folks that are driving our cars, people who are borrowing uh, money from us, and then all the people that work for me and, and the people that are working with the people that work for me. So I, I like to think I try to consider that. I, I know I'm not perfect. I don't do it all the time. And I'm sure, you know, some people may think that I'm not good at it, but I, I really do try my best to uh, engage and understand um, and, and, and act and, and listen with empathy. Yeah. And Sean, that's, it's gotta be a, a critical component of leadership given, I mean, our industry, just thinking about the change, the business challenges that, that our profession has gone through. I mean, the world has gone through on a macro level over the years. I mean, I would, I would imagine having this collaborative approach, teaming, engaging and being right. What two, we have two ears and one mouth, right? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> being the best yep. listener that we can um, helps you foster, foster that teaming environment that you're looking to build or that you have built. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right, right? We should be listening twice as much as as we're speaking. Um, And it it, it can be a challenge. So um, yeah, I don't know what else uh, I I can add to that. Yeah. It does seem though. So people being somewhat of a priority for you, I know definitely in your role, having the knowledge, having the expertise, Right. You're the guy that's that's making the tough decisions, kind of putting people first. I, you know, what other uh, priorities do you have when you think about the partnerships? You talked about all the different stakeholders that, you know, your role interacts with. Like, How do you prioritize that from from your leadership position? Sure. Uh, so I think there's three things that were instilled in me that I try to keep top of mind when I'm thinking of priorities. It's people, quality and profitability. Okay, in that order. Um, so I try to make sure we have good people. We have good working relationships with our people. We're developing folks. We're giving them an opportunity. And that's another thing. I try to never be selfish when a good opportunity is coming up for someone. It's like, oh, well, if somebody somebody wants to change departments and uh, it's going to make us shorthanded over here, I really try to think long and hard. Well, is this a good opportunity for this person? Is this what they want? That, and if it is, let's let's try to really work with them and see if we can absorb, uh, you know, that workload and that backfill um, and and make it happen for them. I hate to deny someone an opportunity that makes sense for them, and especially if it's a, a promotional opportunity, I would never say say no to someone, uh, even though it may shorthand another group. Um, quality is the second part, right? We're um, I'm in accounting, I'm in reporting, making sure the financial information is 
correct is is very important. Um, we don't want to sacrifice quality in any way. And then the last one I'm able to focus on is profitability. And you know, how can we be efficient? Are we identifying areas or ways that we're doing things that can be streamlined? Are we wasting money and time any place? Uh, so that is the third of the, the three criteria that, that I try to focus on with people, quality coming first. And then, of course, thinking about how we can be profitable and how we can be efficient. I think that's great. And I, I love those priorities. And I love that you specifically say in that order, the people, quality and profitability. And even though, you know, profitability, we're talking about doing things more efficient. I, I still think that helps your first priority, your people, because I think when when some of our automated or, or some of our repeatable processes become more efficient, frees up our, our key people to do things that are probably, frankly, a little more interesting for them, mm-hmm. right? That gets them energized and, and they want to continue to innovate and think about other things to do. Um, I love that though. Your, your three pillars of priorities. I might, I might have to use that for myself. <laughs> uh, have you found that, you know, bringing your expertise and your background has helped play that role of the influencer for those in your organization to help understand the, the reason for the audit requests? Uh, yeah, I think it has Katie. Uh, I think that, uh, I have been able to, and my team has been able to uh, work as, in some cases, a sounding board. Like, does this look and sound reasonable? Is this the the right decision without us having to go to the auditors on absolutely everything, right? Because 140 people, we've got a large business, a lot of transactions that we're dealing with on a daily basis. We can't be stopping everything and make, you know, double checking with the auditors on every single question, every single decision. They've got to be able to rely on the fact that our accounting group has mm-hmm. the skill set, has the professional expertise and the wherewithal to be able to to make a good decision. Uh, so I try to make sure I'm not running absolutely everything by them and that we feel equipped to make decisions and that our stakeholders, whether it's the folks in finance and FP&A, uh, that they can rely on that we've made a good analysis and provided good advice. Because I think that goes back to, again, the difference from the audit side to the uh, private side is – I used to be just looking backwards and did we get the answer right? Is it historically accurate? Yes or no. Now it's very much, well, what do you think this is going to do in the future? Can you help us make decisions with uh, liquidity? Can you help us make uh, decisions around budgeting and forecasting? Uh, You know, how can I lend additional support there? So that was very much a a change uh, from my old uh, career to my new career. Absolutely. I, that's a that's a huge shift to be able to start looking looking forward and, and being more of a predictive uh, force mm-hmm. for the accounting group. Absolutely. Yeah. But but at the same time, like you said, still produce monthly information, financial results that your organization uh, can rely on your second pillar quality. Right. Right. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, very good. Well, talking about all of the all of the things that you're managing in your role, I am curious, curious to hear, you know, are there any, we call it, you know, call them uh, the current hot topics of the day, right? Mm -hmm. That are at the forefront for you. I I hear a lot of our clients talking about, be it upcoming ESG regulations, their cyber requirements, inflation reduction act, which I'm just getting smart on. Uh, Pillar Mm -hmm. 2 has been out there. And then I I think also just kind of fundamental are, you know, ongoing talent concerns as we continue to manage. And I think we call it the new hybrid workforce. And I think Mm -hmm. that's still even changing. And then we have tech and right. Every conversation involves AI. So I I just curious, you know, in your role today, what, what's at the forefront for you? So, um, I think the the forefront. You, I'll, I'll try to go in order of the the, com- the comments and issues you raised uh, from a an accounting rules perspective and the uh, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the byproducts of that. Uh, it's reacting to that, working with uh, tax and legal about how can we put ourselves in the in, in a situation to make sure we're complying with all these rules and accounting for them correctly. Uh, you know, if I'm being honest, I'd also look back that. You know, probably over the last 
12 years, uh, you know, we had Sarbanes-Oxley in the, you know, the early 2000s. And then you had in the, the 2010s, you had RevRec come out later, a little bit later in that decade. You had leasing. Uh, and then on the sales finance side, you've had the uh, CECL uh, accounting standard, uh, the, the credit loss expectations. Mm-hmm. Uh, very challenging uh, new uh, accounting rules across all of those standards. It was a, a very busy time at the FASB, uh, you know, with, with some of those new rules and regulations that were coming out. Um, so if I think about the the IRA and its impact, that, there are a lot of legal and regulatory changes, but there, thank goodness the FASB has slowed down a little bit with some of those broader changes. But I also know that they've got a lot on their agenda, like helping uh, companies like, like ours think through uh, emissions related credits, which is something we're, uh, you know, trying to make sure we're, we're accounting for. Uh, the right way and in the most efficient way possible. Um, so that's something that w- we're always watching. Uh, in those new, as, as I love somebody put it this way, accounting job creation acts uh, that, mm. that come out ever so often that, that keep Absolutely. all of our accountants very busy, right? <laughs> um, the other side you mentioned is people, right? So uh, especially in this hybrid work environment that we're in now and that, that Nissan uh, currently deploys and a lot of companies deploy, um, it can represent challenges. I think it's great, right? Giving people flexibility. I'm, I'm all for flexibility. Um, sometimes it presents a challenge for my two main concerns is onboarding new talent and making sure that they feel engaged when they start in a, in a hybrid work environment and then developing talent once they're here. Uh, I feel like it's too easy to just get used to doing uh, what you've always been doing. And it's a little bit harder maybe to branch out and take on new responsibilities and then get, give yourself opportunities for growth. So those are the two things in the hybrid work environment. I'm just always watching and trying to make sure we're, you know, we're keeping an eye on that, especially when new folks are joining or somebody's maybe uh, you know, gotten into a rut uh, and making sure we're thinking about secession planning. Mm-hmm. And that we're, you know, how do we give people opportunities and allow them to, to you know, maybe see other parts of the business? Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes that that's helpful to, you know, have folks go from accounting to finance or to join other groups. Um, and then on the technology front, um, I think uh, that that's constantly evolving. Um, I think, and of course, now AI is the the buzzword, and I like to think we've done a good job to try to use some of the tools that are available to think differently about how we, you know, we work with our systems and our general ledger, and how do we apply those AI tools? And, and I feel like we have barely scratched the surface because um, I, I I could envision a place where you know, fifteen twenty years from now, everyone has on their laptop or their uh, their computer and and an AI tool like a uh, like like a few of the software services that are available, much like people have the uh, spreadsheet software on their computer today. I I think that's where accountants and finance folks have to go with like, okay, how do I play with these tools? That it's not just writing macros and spreadsheets, but it's actually you know, utilizing these uh, artificial intelligence tools to, to think uh, differently and more broadly about what I'm doing, streamline what I'm doing. Because I hear the concern or the, the point of view with accountants all the time. It's like, well, you're not giving me any advice. You're just telling me what what it is, right? You're closing the books and getting the numbers done. How can we get more time into the hands of our accounting team so that they can actually analyze the information not just run at breakneck speed to get the books closed, but how can they take some time to analyze it and then share that with our finance counterparts, share that with others in the organizations? Like, okay, here's what we're seeing, and here's why we're seeing. It. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's going to be critical for our accounting teams in the future to be able to be better business partners. And we hear a yeah. lot of our clients talking about that. But you're right; it's this, uh, you know, the race to close the books. And, and a lot of energy expended there that doesn't leave a lot of time when when really our accountants, they know the ins and outs, right? They know every every transaction that's happening throughout the period. They have that knowledge to be able to tell the why. It's finding them more time to provide the analysis, just as you said, and get those insights back out to the business. So it's it's the analysis the why, and and maybe also too, right? That transforms into a what could we do about it, right? right. If we want, to, if we want to change it, yep. It's yeah, how can we make better decisions uh, with that analysis that's been done? Yep, that's right. You know, uh, 
Here at Deloitte, we just had a recent uh, AI tool that was rolled out to our team members to to try and to pilot. And, you know, it's an interesting concept uh, to think about the world in which something like that does live on everyone's, you know, personal device. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Sean, we'll come back in 15, 20 years. You predicted 15 to 20 years. We're going to come back and pull up this podcast if we're living in that day <laughs> <laughs> and and call you a predictor of the future. Right. Uh, uh, no, I don't think it's too far flung. All right. Let me ask you this now, because you've talked about, uh, Sean, it sounds like a pretty full plate for you here, sir. Yeah. <laughs> really, <laughs> really large team, uh, all dealing with you know making sure our audit relationship is successful and sound. Continually bringing mm-hmm. innovation and new tools to your team, uh, staying on top of news, current events, right? So you can continue to be that leader for your team. Uh, let me ask you, how do you maintain? You know, call it a work-life balance, or I, I know that others use different terms, right? But but how do you balance making sure that the things that are important to you in your personal life still get the same amount of, of need and priority that you assign them? Yeah, I think uh, I'd say earlier in my career, uh, I had much less work-life balance, whether it's, uh, you know, work weeks with uh, upwards of 100 billable hours. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, that could be very challenging. And I, I honestly don't think I could do that anymore. Uh, I'm in my late 40s now. I was able to do that in my 20s and my 30s. I don't think I could do that now. Um, so part of it, I I think it is good to, to work really hard for your craft early in your career. Because quite honestly, you have more energy. Um, now I'm a little bit older. I've got my, my wife and two kids. I have a 17 year old and a 13 year old. Uh, I try to make sure I'm never missing any event uh, or uh, anything that's going on in their lives that I'm present for that. Because it reminds me of, uh, as I mentioned, I was in the national office and my family was in the Philadelphia area. I was working in the New Jersey area. Uh, North Jersey area. And I would travel back and forth between the two. So four days a week, five days a week. Sometimes I was in North Jersey. The rest of the time on the weekends, I was I was at home with my family when the, when the kids were very young. And in hindsight, I don't know if I was fully present in either situation. Right. So in hindsight, I think like, wow, like I wonder if I was doing all that I could for my career then. But I also think like, oh, man, did I miss things with, uh, you know, when my kids were, were growing up when they were younger? So I, I, I like to think my kids don't hold that against me and my wife doesn't hold that against me now. But I, I, sometimes I still think about it. Like, did I miss out on key moments? So I try to make sure uh, I'm always taking time to think about how do I be present for those important moments uh, or even the, you know, what doesn't seem so important. That's Incredibly wise. As you were talking, I was reflecting on the crazy work weeks and the hours mm-hmm. I put in early in my career and I, I'm quite resentful at times, right, for having to work and missing things that I felt were really important at the time. Um and yeah, it is, it, you know, I will say late forties as well and, and reflective. Um, but yeah. I think that's great advice, Sean, that's great advice. All right. Well, I'd like to round out our conversation today. I have a few, um, I don't know, we'll call them hot seat questions. Okay. Uh, Just, uh, you know, something to put you on the spot here to round us out. And first, I'm going to start with, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Hmm. Any superpower? Um, I, I, I don't know. Ever since I was a kid, I always thought flight would be pretty cool. <laughs> no practical application for it. I just always thought it would be cool and fun. And, you know, I think a lot of people have this, you know, dreams of being able to fly. So, uh, uh, yeah, if you're on the spot, f- flight would be able to, would be very cool. I don't know what I would do with that other than just enjoy myself. <laughs> I love it. And nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Name the spot of your dream vacation. It can be somewhere you've already been or somewhere you would like to go. Uh, Hawaii. Uh, I've never been, and uh, we're looking into you know how we can make it happen. It's a, it's a little far away from Nashville, but I've had friends who who've lived there for a little while and and have traveled there, and I hear great things about it, and just uh, would love to check it out. I love it. A little aloha, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, early bird or night owl? Night owl, definitely. Mm-hmm. I am definitely the personality where um, uh, the evening Sean is always uh, hurting morning Sean. Um, I just feel like I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm way more awake at night and way more alert, uh, than I am in the morning. 
<laughs> All right. And last here, kind of rounding out and bringing us back to our topic of resilient in 10 seconds or less. What does it mean to you to be a resilient leader? Uh, it means taking those shots and challenges and becoming stronger as a result of them. I love it. Well, Sean, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it has been an absolute delight uh, to visit with you and hear all about your background, your perspectives. Uh, and so really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. My pleasure, Katie. Wasn't that great? So many insights and memorable takeaways. Sean's career journey highlighted just how resilient one can be shifting from a public accounting auditor to the leader of a privately held organization with 140 members on his team. His adaptability to meet the expectation of his organization is both impressive and inspiring. I loved how Sean is so keenly focused on the people aspect of his role and that it's not just the numbers. The numbers are important, but the people are a priority. His methodology around the three pillars of people, quality, and profitability, and in that exact order, Sean prioritizes his day-to-day -day and highlights his spirit of diligence, determination, and dynamic teaming and leadership. If we can empower others through stories of resilience, we can do the same for ourselves and our own organizations. I want to thank everyone for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Resilient Controller podcast, and we look forward to having you join us as we engage with controllers and chief accounting officers in future episodes.